Chaa is really is uh, covers just England. It does not cover Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. But those particular countries have got their own versions of the NHR. And as you can see on the map there, um, that's that's our spread. Um, and they do cover quite a variety of different clinical areas. If the one that you're not um, that interests you is not on that list, there will be other bits of the NHR that actually look after that. And I'm quite happy to share the generic email address where you can make inquiries about this. So in terms of um, where we sit within the technology readiness levels, I've mentioned um, before, we're sort of between TRL3 and TRL7, which means we're there to validate um, the, so the clinical need. Um, we're there to help companies work out their reimbursement routes. So we don't do reimbursement, but we can tell you where your technology fits in within some particular reimbursement. And we're also there to support the product development as well. And that can come in terms of um, feasibility studies, proof of concept um, work, and even some prototyping support, depending on sort of where your technology sits and whether we've got that expertise. Um, our particular cooperative focuses on surgery, and that's because surgery is the, the large player in terms of secondary care. Most of it really does exist because of surgery. And we cover um, the main areas um, for surgery, for general surgery, which include colorectal, vascular, HPB, which covers your liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. And we recently added neurosurgery as well. Um, and that's typically where most of the surgical procedures um, take place within the NHS. So that's, that's what we, we cover. Um, and we are also supported academically. So if you're looking for academic or methodology support in any of the areas shown on the screen, that is something that we're also able to support. And this does extend into software and artificial intelligence because we're starting to see more technologies um, in this particular area. Each of the cooperatives also works on the basis of um, unmet needs, unmet clinical needs. So this is just an example of some of our unmet um, clinical needs. So these are the areas that the NHS is prioritizing in terms of medical technology. So that is where most of the resources are going to go. Um, and technologies aren't necessarily restricted to the operating theatre. It can be technologies to prevent people going into theatre or to maximise their chances of recovery um, or post-operative recovery. So that includes your remote monitoring and software actually does come um, a lot into, into that equation. So um, this is basically why we do it. And one of the things that we do is we build collaborations with different players. And this is where EG technology comes in today. Um, so we, we can't do everything ourselves. Um, you know, our main strengths really lie within the clinical expertise, um, patient and public involvement. So if you're looking for med tech focus groups to find out what your end users um, want to see within a particular technology or their concerns about a technology, that's what we're there for. Um, if you're looking for grant funding collaborators um, to meet any of the areas shown on the screen, then that is something else that we also do for the areas that we cover. Um, and sort of finally, just to wrap it up, um, we develop collaboration. So we are working closely with EG Technology to provide a lot of the expertise that we do not have. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do to highlight this particular collaboration was to set up this webinar so that you can also find out about what they do and what support you can access from EG Technology. And all the, you can ask them all the questions that you've got in, um, for your you know, particular context and technology. Um, the surgical MIC, we fund some proof of concept studies. Um, you know, we're not talking big money here, but if you just want, you know, up to 10K to sort of cross a line to get you to the next stage, that is something that we can look at assessing. And some of the other cooperatives will do that as well. Um, and finally, we can also help to leverage additional funding. We've done that for a couple of companies within the software space where we're, we're quite successful in helping them with particularly Innovate UK funding. Um, and in return, we're also able to provide a clinical site where they can actually um, conduct some of the evaluations and work with some of the staff in the hospital setting to actually refine that technology. Um, so that's basically who the Surgical Medtech Cooperative is. This is why we've set up this webinar, because we do want people to access um, the resources that other people have, other organisations have, because we do want to see more technology come into into the NHS and um, where we're enablers in that sense. 
Um, so what I'll do now is I'll hand you over to David and David's going to introduce himself and then he's going to lead the webinar. And in the meantime, if you've got any questions, then please use the Q&A function um, of, the, of the Microsoft Teams um, software and we will look at going through the questions at the end of the session. Um, so David, I will enable the presenting function for you. So ready when you are. OK, great. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm assuming you can hear me OK. That is always the first test. And let me just share my screen. You OK, able to see that OK? OK, excellent. So uh, thank, thank you, B, for that. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining this uh, NIHR workshop. So my name is David Warwick and I'm one of the directors at EG Technology. We specialise in the design and development of medical devices and in vitro diagnostics and about 70% of all the work that we do is in this med tech sector. Uh, by way of personal background, my original degree was in computer systems engineering and I've now spent nearly 20 years working on medical devices and regulatory affairs in the medical and biotech sector. Uh, what that means is that I've taken lots and lots of medical devices with software through 62304 assessment, which we'll talk about quite a bit today, uh, CE marking and FDA approval, uh, including devices with, with software safety class C, which is the highest risk category. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to take you through what I hope is some practical advice on the development of software for medical devices and health software in general. Um, We'll also look briefly at cybersecurity and AI as these are some hot topics and new regulatory guidance is now starting to be published in these areas. So the the obligatory slide on on various project products that we've we've developed for other people, uh, many of which are medical, but some of which are also consumer oriented as well, including things like an RFID cat feeder and the Hive Home Hub. Um, so um, whether or not you're deep in the R&D phase or preparing for your clinical evaluation and whether or not you eventually expect to launch your product in the UK, the EU or global markets, uh, what I want to stress is that following an established software development process gives you the best chance of success at each stage of your development and a solid foundation for maintenance and support as your product grows. In this webinar, I'll start by giving a brief overview of some of the key aspects of medical device classification uh, and talk briefly about both the IEC 62304 and 82304 standards. Um, so I'll start with a quick introduction uh, on medical device classification and hopefully we'll see how that's linked to the software safety classification that's given in IEC 62304. Then we'll remind ourselves of some of the key points um, for the software development life cycle. Then during the second half of this pre presentation, uh, rather than a rather dry run through the standards, I want to try and take a slightly more practical approach and look in a bit more detail at different ways that you can actually structure your software um, to help keep some of the safety critical aspects more manageable. As we'll see towards the end, um, the initial development is is rapidly becoming not the biggest challenge uh, because there's an increasing focus on ongoing maintenance and updates um, and that needs particular particular careful consideration uh, if you've got a connected medical device because we'll we'll look at some of the most recent guidance in this area and hopefully illustrate how developments in regulatory issues such as cybersecurity and artificial intelligence can still link back to the same fundamental principles of risk management that form the cornerstone of the regulatory process. Just thinking about um, medical devices in general, we're talking about medical devices here, uh, obviously very similar analogies can be made for in vitro diagnostics as well. Uh, most people probably know something about the different classifications of medical device. Um, what I put on this slide is a kind of anecdotal ad hoc method of classification and you, you sometimes hear people quoting this uh, 
perhaps unsurprisingly, these are not the descriptions used in the regulations. Um, but what it does do is introduce the idea that medical device regulation is all about the risks inherent within in the device uh, with a particular impact or uh, focus on the potential impact on the patient. Uh, anyone who needs to work out their device classification actually needs to run through the classification rules. These are generally straightforward. They're provided for in the medical device regulation or, or IVDR, if that's what we're working on. Um, uh, as I say, they're generally straightforward, but can lead to some surprising results, uh, especially with respect to devices that you might worry are at the higher end of classification, class 2B or class 3, but if you apply the rules carefully, um, you might actually find that it turns out to be only a, a class 2A or, or a 2B. Uh, as an example, uh, two systems pictured here are both used to uh, help detect, uh, to image the skin, to help detect skin cancer. Uh, the device at the top is a class one and can therefore be self-certified. However, the device at the bottom is a class 2A because it happens to incorporate some IR light. Now, if we delve into the detail, uh, Annex 8 classification rule 10 includes specific wording about non-visible light. So it doesn't actually matter that the intensity of the light in this device is about the same as a typical TV remote control. Believe me, we, we try to get away with that one. Um, the wording of the regulation is very clear and, and that subtle change to class 2A is significant because it means that the device at the bottom required a third party assessment, a, a notified body audit before it could be CE marked. But I want to stress this isn't really about, this isn't about under or over classifying your device or attempting to bend the rules. It's about being accurate, since in addition to the specific requirements of the regulations, the, the classification sets the tone for the level of rigor for your whole development program. And with that in mind, the device classification, device classification also helps you think about software safety, but there isn't an explicit link as we'll see in a moment. So the first thing to do is determine how your software will be classified. Uh, so first you need to think about whether you're actually developing a medical device or are you developing more general purpose health software. Uh, the definition of a medical device or in vitro diagnostic comes from the applicable regulations, not from the IEC standards that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, that's true whether we're talking about the EU, the US or other global territories. Uh, the question really is where does the boundary lie between medical device software and health software? There's Because the, there are always going to be grey areas and the, the standards really even acknowledge this. Um, the approach that I recommend is to actually take a step back and make sure you're really clear, first of all, about your intended use and, and actually write it down. This is, this is quite a good exercise. You might be surprised at how hard it is to consolidate all of the aspirations and the potential uses you've got for your product into maybe just one or two paragraphs, maybe even one or two sentences, remembering that everything that you claim in that intended use needs to be backed up with evidence. Having written it down, you can then check how your intended use aligns with the precise wording of the regulations uh, and consider the risks. Nine times out of ten, this, this careful review will give you the appropriate answer. The importance of risk assessment uh, as part of the classification process is best underlined by an example. So, so let's consider the Windows operating system as a, as a potential borderline case. Uh, the same could be true of any you know, popular platform OS or off the shelf software. Uh, if I'm running a medical device on Windows, does Windows and the associated PC become a medical device? Well, let's let's think for a moment about two different scenarios. On the one hand, if you think back to the, my previous slide, uh, if you're using a PC to show a live video feed of a video enabled device, uh, and that device plugs into the PC, perhaps via USB, just like a webcam or anything like that, uh, and can be shown on the screen using broadly standard software. It's probably a reasonable starting point to assume that you don't need to validate the whole of the operating system. Um, 
after all, we're, we're using this technology right now. You've got millions of people all over the world accessing similar technology for both medical and non-medical applications every day. Um, if you can demonstrate that the performance, your performance with basic functional testing, then the risk of the operating system, in this case, contributing to failure is, is significantly reduced. Um, we all know there's a risk of video dropouts. So, you, so it's not that you're you're ignoring those, but you all you need to do is be clear how to manage those risks. Provided that, for example, the worst can happen is you wait a few minutes whilst the PC reboots, then that risk is probably sufficiently low that it becomes acceptable. Or to use the correct terminology um, from the standards, the benefits outweigh the residual risks. Uh, when you're considering risks, it's it's legitimate to question whether the level of testing you can realistically achieve yourselves is likely to identify a flaw that hasn't already been spotted in the extensive testing in some that goes into something like Windows. So in some instances the use of off-the-shelf software is, is actually appropriate. It's actually a lower risk development route. Um, but on the other hand if we take a more extreme case if you were planning to use Windows as the underlying operating system to run a ventilator uh, keeping somebody alive you'd want to be pretty sure that it isn't go on, going to go off and install Windows updates and reboot whilst you're not looking. So th that's a bit of an extreme case, but all we're trying to illustrate here is that you move as you move into the higher risk scenarios, you might need to design in additional safeguards or look for supporting software that has been specifically developed for safety critical industries. Uh, time and time again, you'll see references to risk management and I'll mention it lots and lots of times during this talk um, and the specific mention of ISO 14971 which is the the risk management standard for medical device development. This applies to both um, 62304 for medical device software and 82304 for health software and managing the risks should really underpin the way you think about your software. So if we take a quick look at some of the wording from the MDR, um, we can see how this risk profiling of the software manifests in different device classifications. So as a starting point, software takes the same classification as the broader device of which it forms a part. Um, but then if we're talking about standalone software, um, if you're providing information used to inform clinical decisions, then you're at least a 2A, unless the implications are serious or even very serious. Yeah, in a practical sense, what this tends to mean is that the vast majority of medical device software falls into class 2A or higher, since in most cases software does at least have some impact on, on clinical decision making. Uh, and remember that C marking class 2A medical device requires a conformity assessment by a notified body. The distinction between health software and medical device software can be really quite subtle, uh, as, as I've mentioned. Um, the distinction made in the standards is that uh, health software is intended by the manufacturer for uh, managing or maintaining or improving the health of individuals or improving the delivery of care, whereas a medical device is specifically intended for the diagnosis prevention monitoring or treatment uh, of, of disease. Um, whether a health software product has to meet regulatory requirements is actually a matter for uh, national legislation. That the same is is true for medical devices, but but most territories or all territories around the world have specific legislation for medical devices, less so uh, in terms of formal legislation with health software. Uh, the standards themselves make, make no attempt to determine whether a health software product is or should be regulated. Uh, and it's perhaps worth remembering, particularly in the context of health software, that um, other legal aspects may be pertinent, things like uh, GDPR for, for data protection and those sorts of things. Uh, a specific distinction made in 82304 is that it's uh, for software designed to operate on general purpose computing platforms uh, and intended to be placed on the market without dedicated hardware. So that, that's one area of specific distinction. But 
Nevertheless, actually, 82304 leans heavily on the life cycle processes uh, detailed in 62304, and there's a considerable amount of overlap. Uh, the focus is really still on demonstrating that your software development has been performed with appropriate rigor, showing that you've considered the risks associated with your software and followed a development process. This might sound onerous, but it, it doesn't really need to be. All, all we're saying here is really that you need to use the principles of good software engineering, good product development, hacking together something, uh, regardless of your target industry really, is, is not the foundation for a solid product development. It's also worth um, just noting, and this, this, this sort of extends beyond uh, pure software development, that, that theoretically you don't have to follow these international standards, but you would have to justify any alternative route, and that is almost always more difficult. Remember, in the in this context, we're talking about the software lifecycle and and demonstrating your approach to design and development. Um, in that context, actually, these standards are well aligned with what is generally regarded as good development practice. So the regulations themselves don't mandate the use of the standard. The the regulations use the phrase state of the art. It actually appears uh, something like 12 times in the MDR. Um, uh, and, and that phrase state of the art can be a little concerning. But if, if, if you delve into the definition, uh, which uh, ISO and the IEC provide, um, they, they state very clearly that that state of the art does not necessarily imply the most technologically advanced solution, but rather it what they're implying here as is currently and generally accepted good practice in terms of development, in terms of technology, in terms of medicine. Um, it's, it's really the given stage of technical capability at a given time with regards the performance of your product, the processes which you follow to develop it, uh, and the services that you provide with it. Um, the, the broader question of regulatory approvals is beyond the scope of this talk, but what again, what I'm trying to emphasize is that aligning your software development to these recognized international standards uh, gives your product the smoothest pass through the development process and into all of your potential target markets. So uh, once you start thinking about software, safety classification, we need to be clear that we are now talking specifically about the software. So while there's, it's common for there to be a link between the overall device classification we discussed a moment ago and the software safety classification, there isn't a direct correlation. Um, we're now, now talking about the risks that are specifically contributed to or mitigated by the software. Uh, if you remember back to my earlier slide, the, the, the software classification safety classification levels, um, class A, B and C, actually align pretty well with my ad hoc off the cuff uh, description of medical device classification, except this time that the wording on this slide is the actual definitions used in the standards. Um, unfortunately, what we still don't have is really a, a fully comprehensive definition of injury. Uh, and there's no real time limits defined as to when that hazard might occur. So a common conundrum at the early stage of your development is if if a software hazard means, for example, that a doctor misses a diagnosis, uh, perhaps the patient later presents with more serious symptoms, is that a serious injury to the patient or not? Um, this this can get quite complicated, but, but I advise you to bear in mind a few things. Um, one is to time bound it a little bit you know is the risk immediate is it is it going to occur right now um, is the risk as a result of a fault in the software a software bug or is it a broader limitation of the system possibly even a limitation of the statistic, statistical accuracy of your technique or the ability to detect a atypical symptoms or anything like that um, you also need to think about remembering the rules from, from the previous slide. Is, is your software providing an explicit diagnosis? Is it the only method of diagnosis? Or are there other symptoms, tests, clinical judgment that we are 
will be applied in conjunction with the software, um, which reduce the overall risk of a mis misdiagnosis. Um, so if we go back to our ventilator analogy, clearly if a ventilator fails as a result of a software error, um, there's a potential immediate risk to or risk of death or serious injuries. Uh, so in some cases, the answer is pretty clear cut. Um, but on the other hand, when I was going through the approvals of those skin cancer cameras that I had on an earlier slide, we successfully argued that no injury or damage to health as as a result of software failure was possible. Now, you might start from the point of view that uh, of an argument that goes along the lines of if the software fails and there's a missed or delayed diagnosis, then when the patient's cancer progresses one month later and it's a melanoma, doesn't that lead to death or serious injury? Um, but this is where you need to be carefully think about the risks that are actually inherent in the software. Um, and in this case, in this example, several factors reduce those software risks. Um, we talked about the fact that there's no immediate specific risk or threat to health in the case of something like a ventilator. Um, and in, in the instance of the these imaging systems, all the software actually did was take a picture. Neither of these system Im systems employed clever algorithms or AI prompting with a diagnosis. The clinician in this case remained entirely responsible for the diagnosis based on their clinical assessment of those images. As we mentioned before, there's obviously the clear failure to take an image, but there are no reasonably foreseeable risks that resulted in the software presenting the wrong image. A, a corruption of the image was absolutely immediately obvious to anybody using the system. Um, and in typical cases, there will be other clinical indicators uh, which would be accessed as part of the clinical diagnosis as well. So all of these things serve to, to keep the overall risk of the system down. Um, in clinical trials, it was then shown in, in the, for these the imaging devices, they were shown to improve the standard of care. But it's, for, for any device, it's important to remember that improving the standard of care doesn't mean you need to be perfect. It doesn't mean you need to achieve 100 percent. You just need to improve on the state of the art, as we discussed earlier. Um, and then you have uh, other other minor risk mitigations, for example, atypical cases of uh, melanoma are very difficult to pick up by any system. They're atypical for a reason. Um, and so the inability of the software to detect atypical cases um, was not specifically a software related risk. You know, they, it, it, it didn't add or reduce the risk of a misdiagnosis in that kind of scenario. It's also important to remember that you aren't required to mitigate uh, implausible risks. So, so as we said earlier, be, beware of constructing really long chains of events that lead you to a negative overall outcome. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, and then the patient suffered some harm. But you, you need to think back and think, can, can the software reasonably mitigate that, that whole chain of events by one particular action? It's important because as the safety concerns in the software increase, so does the level of rigor that you need to apply to the software development. Uh, and the standard sets out which requirement, uh, which parts of the, of the st standard apply at each level. Of course, there's nothing stopping you uh, applying more than is required. You're unlikely to get away with applying less than is required. Um, so if you're hovering in that grey area between classifications, it might make sense to err on the side of caution. Uh, the flip side of this, of course, is that if you're confident uh, in your rationale, if, if you've built it well, if you've documented it well, then there are sections, whole sections that you actually don't need to apply. And you've got a standard that you can point at um, if you're questioned by an auditor. As as with the overall device classification, this isn't really about trying to squeeze in a, below a particular threshold or bend the rules. It's, it's about making an objective balance assessment and then following the appropriate product development steps. So 62304 and 82304 established a requirement for software lifecycle processes. Um, what that means at its core is that the standard tells you the 
processes you need to implement and what activities you need to undertake for the safe design and maintenance of medical device software. So you aren't accredited to 62304. It works in much the same way as risk management. You apply the principles as part of your product development process and demonstrate that you followed them on a specific device in your technical file. So it's really a kind of an extension of, of the quality management system that you need to wrap around the whole of a medical device development to make sure that your software development processes meet the particular challenges of software development and as we'll see in a moment increasingly test and maintenance into the future. Uh, the standards not prescriptive very, very few are it doesn't say you will use this particular coding standard it doesn't say you will use this particular language um, nor does it really give you a huge amount of information on how to implement the required processes in your organization it simply tells you the areas you need to cover and provide evidence for not really a, a template for how to achieve it um, in some respects, this is one of the biggest strengths of the standard because you can adopt a, a pretty pragmatic development approach appropriate to the product in question. So modern programming methodologies can be incorporated into the framework. So you can use industry standard development processes such as Agile. They're, they're absolutely aligned with the requirements uh, of the 62304 standard. Remember our definition of state of the art from earlier, a developed stage of technical ability at a given time with regard to process, uh, generally accepted as good practice in technology and medicine. So we're not aiming to reinvent the wheel here. We're simply looking to follow and to be able to show that your development followed good design and development practice. Uh, as I said earlier, provided you're, you're following sound engineering principles, true for your broader device as well and you're not just hacking things together you've you've got most of that solid foundation on which to build your documentary evidence so as we move forward now uh, I, I want to talk a bit more about some of the techniques that you might actually use to help constrain the scope of your software development uh, and and how to keep the software taste testing and ongoing maintenance of that software manageable. Um, the aim is really to start with a software architecture that provides a foundation for your software into the foreseeable future. Uh, it's a required part of the 62304 development standard, but in, in doing so, you're hoping to maintain the, the flexibility to develop and update the software. Uh, only needing major retesting and, and resubmission uh, when appropriate for the changes that you've actually made. In general, and, and by default, the software system takes on the same risk category as the most risky subsection of the software, uh, of, the, of the whole software. But um, fortunately, the, the standard allows you to break that software down into smaller software items as they're called in the standard um, and assign potentially different classifications to different parts of the system. So through careful system design, you can identify and segregate some of the more risky aspects of the software from those that might carry, carry a lower risk um, if there happens to be a failure. So in the next few slides, we'll explore different ways of achieving this. Again, the most important message is that these design decisions need to be taken at the start of the project uh, as they're key to the system architecture that you'll be developing. You, you can't bolt them on later without substantial risks in terms of the time and the cost implications for, for any rework. So the first thing we consider in any uh, software project is medical device software project is whether the risks arising from the software could actually be mitigated in hardware. Uh, generally speaking, this is a good approach if you've got fixed, uh, easily measurable parameters where uh, a cutout type hardware function could ensure that the worst, most serious risks are mitigated. Uh, another way to think about this is whether you can design the system so that the software can only control the system within a safe, lower risk range um, with the hardware then providing safety critical backups, a safety critical backstop. Uh, within the safe range, it, 
you might still have risks associated with suboptimal treatment or risks associated with uh, with lower level of harm. The, the point here is that the most serious risks, the most critical risks are taken care of by independent hardware. But in, in many modern systems, the term, determination of an error uh, can require much more complex measurement or a derived measurement, or there might just be simply too many scenarios than you can realistically cover in discrete hardware. Hardware mitigation is a valuable tool, uh, but don't be too afraid to look for software solutions. So the diagram on this slide uh, outlines an approach that we regularly use to help segregate the design and verification of the, the higher safety classification systems. Uh, as you might guess from the name, the safety processor maintains responsibility for ensuring all safety critical aspects of performance are maintained, assuming the main processor goes wrong. With some careful design choices, what, what we tend to try and do is keep the functions of the safety processor reduced to only those core safety functions, because this narrows the scope of your most safety critical software, making it easier to code the system overall and easier to validate the system overall. Sometimes it's not actually about the function of individual components. It can be the order in which they're used or the tasks which they're asked to perform. Um, this can be particularly useful in lab automation for devices that might incorporate a range of functionality, a range of treatments based on sequencing of individual hardware components. This method generally assumes that the software has some elements, the, the hardware elements, whose, whose performance and response to stimulus can be rigorous, rigorously defined and tested. So the actuation of valves, the movement of syringe pumps, pumping and moving through you know, fluids through the system, for example. The clinical benefit and therefore the clinical risk uh, in instruments like this derive from operating the correct sequence of, of the hardware and the ability to reproduce that sequence time after time. So in a sense, you separate out the functional elements, the, the items of hardware from the order in which the events happen. And therefore you can reduce the overall burden of testing and maintenance in the medium term because a change in the order of operations doesn't necessarily doesn't necessitate a complete system retest, you already know that the individual hardware components will work as intended. Um, and this approach can be particularly useful if, if different protocols are going to be evaluated, perhaps during clinical trials, because what you're doing really is shifting the emphasis to the areas of clinical risk, the clinical performance of your sequence of your assay rather than worrying about whether the device hardware works uh, as intended. Uh, and in some circumstances, it, it might be sufficient to simply modularize the software and classify items on the same processor with different levels of safety classification. Uh, diagnostic algorithms are a really good example of this because uh, in this scenario, it's not so much about the risk of the software failing, um, but if the algorithm gets the answer wrong, what, what are the risks then? And what are the risks when you change that critical element of the code in the future? Um, so whether we're talking about mathematical algorithms or some kind of dynamic adaptive machine learning, what you're acknowledging is if, if these critical functions are to change in the future, uh, then considerably more scrutiny should go into validating those changes changes to those higher risk modules than, for example, correcting a typo on the user interface. Uh, what we're really trying to do here with all these different techniques is to build an architecture that illustrates that only some of the functionality is, is critically dependent for safety. There are other aspects to the system which, which, while important and while they do have risks, don't constitute the same level of risk uh, if a change is to be made. Uh, and this brings me on to the, the sort of what, what are they really worried about slide, uh, because whole sections of, of both the uh, 62304 and 82304 standards are actually devoted to software maintenance. Um, and these quotes kind of neatly il illustrate the other main focus of regulators regulators' safety concerns. It, it's the ease of introducing safety issues 
after the products on the market. And this this is we'll see in the next few slides is becoming much more important and much more an area of focus. It's it's something which is almost a unique property of software and compared with the scrutiny of the initial review to, to get your UKCA or C mark initially. Post launch updates really rely quite heavily on manufacturers being open and honest about the scope of their software updates, um, which is why ensuring you have the correct maintenance processes in place when you launch the that the product is is so carefully reviewed while while they've got a chance. There are a whole range of reasons for updating software in the field, and and these aren't typically limited, uh, particularly these days, to um, pure corrective actions to to fixing bugs. More often than not, software updates are also uh, they also include new features, potentially in, intended performance improvements. Um, and as we'll see on the next few slides, the same general principles of risk management throughout the whole product life cycle are now being applied to some of the most recent guidance uh, related to cybersecurity uh, and are also likely to be the foundation of any new guidance or regulations on systems that integrate artificial intelligence. So of particular relevance for health software, but coming under increasing scrutiny for all medical devices is the issue of privacy and security uh, with so many connected devices coming onto the market. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are other legislative requirements to maintain privacy and ensure patient confidentiality, including things like GDPR. Um, although a discussion of those those other regulations is, is really beyond the scope of this talk, but Thinking back to the previous slide, it's often new and emerging security threats in these connected devices that are the basis for the software updates. So with connected devices, it's also common to rely on third party software, uh, whether that's pre-built modules or library code, for example, to provide the underlying connectivity. If the operating system that you're using uh, is updated, perhaps with security updates, it becomes almost inevitable that you'll have to release updates for your software and therefore you need to ensure that you've got those maintenance processes in place. Uh, it's also important to consider the, the practical aspects of software which have broader support implications as, as well as implications for safety because there might be multiple different versions in the field at any one time or the software might need to run on multiple different platforms in the, in the NHS this could also include legacy platforms I suspect if you look hard enough you'll find some Windows XP machines still around you know Vista and Windows 7. Connected devices could also go many months without being connected uh, or perhaps end up being located in parts of the hospital with really poor coverage. Um, so as we've seen at this stage, it's 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 the solid design foundation that's critical because you need that software architecture that allows you to make changes to the software in a way that's proportionate to the risks and keeps them manageable. As always, before things get out too out of hand, uh, you need to take it back to first principles and think, what are the risks? How do the updates impact the performance of your software? And careful segregation of the design from the outset can help you ensure that this that you keep the impact of these changes minimized and therefore the need for full retest or, or re audit recertification um, is also minimized. To, to only those times when it is is truly appropriate. So um, just in terms of latest guidance in areas around um, both cybersecurity, uh, artificial intelligence and AI, um, this is probably the most recent piece of guidance that only came out earlier this month. Um, and the principles found in this guidance document from the FDA are that they're focused on improve the improvement of device cybersecurity for, for medical devices, but hopefully in the next couple of slides I'll, I'll show that we're, we're starting to see some common themes emerging. The emphasis uh, in this guidance is on the total product life cycle. The product life cycle is a part of 62304 and, and thinking back a couple of slides ago, it, it's primarily concerned about the risks associated with the software 
and software updates once it's been placed onto the market. You know, it further confirms that, that safety and efficacy through risk management just it needs to underpin the way you think about your device, your software development and the way in which you provide support. Um, it's also worth noting that publication of this guidance hasn't required uh, a change in the federal regulations. So if, if you remember back to some of my earlier slides, the MDR doesn't reference specific standards either. It uses the terminology state of the art. This allows new guidance to be published and best practice to move forward. Now, I'm mixing regulatory jurisdictions a bit here, but but th there's more in common between the different regulators than there are differences. And perhaps the key message is that some of the latest and most comprehensive guidance on cyber, cyber security has recently been published by the FDA. Now, while that, that can't be directly applied to CE marking, it's certainly a significant contribution to what is considered state of the art. And therefore you might expect that by following the, the the principles of this guidance, you are following state of the art and therefore meet both the requirements in Europe as well. The cybersecurity guidance has got quite a bit to say on the subject of field updates. Uh, I don't intend to read through each of these bullet points now, um, but if, if if you look at them, hopefully you'll agree that they seem seem logical and they, they seem proportionate. Um, what I'd actually like you to do really is, is scan through these bullet points and imagine that all of the references to cybersecurity are replaced by artificial intelligence or replaced by machine learning. The idea that medical device software in field is continuously updated. And I think this starts to give us some insight into the likely direction of travel. So again, this slide's pretty wordy and I don't really want to dwell on it now, but I want to emphasize the broader points about devices in field having different software configurations. And therefore, if we extend the analogy again to AI, the potential for devices in field to have differing levels of performance from launch and differing levels of performance potentially from each other. Uh, the final par paragraph about the end of life is also well made. There's, there's typically going to be a time horizon after which it's it's unreasonable and, and commercially impractical to keep providing software updates. Uh, and it seems likely that this date could well fall before the date that the device itself is taken out of service. So again, we're acknowledging that the older software remaining in service presents a potential risk. So from my comments on the previous slide, uh, I hope it's clear really that my personal view is that we can expect future guidance for AI to take a very similar approach to the recent cybersecurity guidance. Um, there, there have been and there are ongoing consultations in both the uh, EU, UK and, and US. No, uh, there are other global ones, no doubt. Um, but yeah, they, they they seem to be following a common theme. The, the initial development of the software still needs careful consideration because the architecture that you choose and the design decisions you make at the early stage set the regulatory traje trajectory for the device. Concerns around cybersecurity or the development of AI are in many respects no different to those that the authorities have been concerned about for for many years. You know, so they're, they're still concerned about the safety, the efficacy and the reliability of the device throughout its entire life. But but the emphasis is is shifting. It, it's not about now just checking its performance when it was first launched on the market. What we're seeing is is not necessarily new regulation, but but a shift to from pre-market to safety and efficacy throughout the entire product life cycle. So uh, in conclusion, uh, 62304 and 82304 standards provide a good outline for how to develop your medical device or health software. Uh, both adopt a risk-based approach and I encourage you to think about that in the context Think about the risks in the context of your whole system, you know, whether that includes hardware, whether it's software as a medical device, whether it's an integrated device. It, always think about the, the risks in the system. Documenting your decisions, documenting your, your 
rationale is a, a really good discipline. It means you actually have to it means you actually have to write it down. Um, and rather than based on gut feel, you 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 have that rationale mapped out for why a particular safety safety classification, why you consider these risks to be most important, why you've segregated your design in that particular way. Um, but be honest with yourselves. It, don't go overboard. Uh, it, it, it's easy to get on your 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 blackest of black hats and 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 talk yourself into doomsday scenarios and. And that's that's not necessary, um, but but equally, don't try and fly under the radar. As I said earlier, it's about trying to take an, an objective, balanced, you know, reasonable view of of the the, the risks that are inherent in your system. Um, but you need to make sure you start as you mean to go on, which is is why this idea of, of software architecture and think about your safety for classification and documenting your decisions at the early stage is so important because attempting to retrofit this is going to be really costly. It's going to be time consuming uh, and it's ultimately going to increase your, your time to market. As you saw at the end, I mean, the most Recent guidance is shifting emphasis uh, to the total product life cycle, but but as we saw in some of the slides, it's actually an area they've they've always been concerned about. So we can expect lots of new guidance to come out, but actually the regulations already allow for that guidance to be developed. Um, it, it it is really just a shift in focus. Um, to make sure you you've carefully considered how you're going to manage your devices uh, once they've been deployed. Um, it it all, but perhaps it sounds uh, sounds a bit daunting, and 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 it's true that there are some nuances uh, involved in dotting the i's and crossing the t's and 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 getting through a notified body or audit, audit or a, a, a six two three eight four assessment. Um, but the message I really want you to take away is that. An awful lot of this is really just good practice. It's good practice for medical device development. Uh, it's good practice for software development and just for, for product development as a whole. So uh, I encourage you to think about that throughout your uh, throughout your product developments. And then I'm hoping V might have curated any questions for me uh, that might have occurred during the course of that talk. Yeah, certainly. Thank, thank you, David. Um, and um, if anyone's got any, there's a couple of questions we can get started on. Um, but I can also give a few people the option if you find it easier to ask your question via your mic, um, then please put put your hand up, or just put something in the chat function, and then I will I'll unmute, unmute you personally. So um, the first question we have actually is um, is GDPR a concern, for example, using a camera on a patient with identifiable information. So basically, is that a relevant risk or is it considered separately? Uh, uh, well, so if, if you're if you've got identifying information, um, then it's going to fall under the auspices of the GDPR. So you are going to need to think about that carefully. Um, they're, they're subtly different things, of course, because the the patient data is isn't a a medical device risk in that sense. So, so in in a in a very broad sense, um, the 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 safety and efficacy of the medical device itself is not going to be too concerned with uh, privacy and security. But of course, you know, GDPR is a legislative requirement, as is the medical device regulation. So, so if you've if you've got that uh, identifiable data, if you're keeping that, then you do need to to make sure that you've uh, uh, you know covered covered off those areas, and the things like the cybersecurity guidance uh, are it covers cybersecurity guidance covers a really broad gamut of things because they're obviously concerned about um, particular attacks, disabling devices, all of those sorts of things, but they're also worried about security breaches, breaches of patient data and all of those sorts of things as well. Okay, thank you. Um, second question we have, um, in terms of risk assessment, how do you differentiate between implausible worst case scenarios and appropriate consideration of a worst case. 
case scenario? Um, so I think it, it's something that, that a lot of people struggle with. Um, a good good overall technique for that is, is really to um, map out the risks that you think can occur in your system uh, at the start before you actually get into the mechanics of, of doing the risk assessment. So uh, a technique we commonly use is we'll actually have a, uh, some thinking around what the what the risks are and cl classifying those risks uh, or, or the, the actual hazards are um, before we start working through how can they occur and that sort of thing. So yeah, if 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 the device suffers a failure, what you know, what are the what what is the outcome of that? Is is there a risk to the patient? Because then what you can do is is map that product failure to all the different circumstances, all the it, under which that that failure can occur. And what that helps you to do, I suppose, is as you're as you're working through your risk assessment. You, you will hopefully find that there are actually only a few different potential outcomes from the system. Um, and so you, you, you can map them onto the ones you've already thought about rather than going down the rabbit hole each time you think of a new risk. That That's not, I don't feel like that's really a very satisfactory answer, but the, the, there's probably an entire talk to be done on on risk management and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, if if you identify the the actual harms that and uh, that can occur to the patient before you start delving into the risk management, that will hopefully keep you a little bit more grounded um, in in terms of disappearing down the rabbit hole of of doomsday scenarios. Yeah, thanks. And I think it sort of links in. So, for example, with some of the work that um, that we do with the with the clinicians, I think they're also a good source for exploring what um, what harm looks like um, and what actually risk management looks like from their perspective. Um, so, you know, to avoid people going down the rabbit hole of, you know, the whole entire electric grid goes down. You know, I need to factor all of this into account is actually if you talk to the clinicians they can actually tell you what's most what's most important to them and, what and that yeah and that, that, <laughs> that, that as 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 sort of product development engineers that that clinical insight is really really important so because we can help you quantify you know the risk of failure of a particular part the risk of electric shock the risk of the sort of tangible things but um but you you do need that clinical insight as part of your risk management to to understand what's what's the actual problem here what's the actual outcome because because engineers will often fall think in very kind of black and white terms like this has failed such and such will happen patient dies very bad um and 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 a clinician will say ah but standard practice if that occurs is that we'll do this and then we'll do that and things things potentially completely unassociated with your device but things which mitigate the risk to the patient because lots of these things are you know they they of course they have an inherent risk to them and so there are there are already risk management activities built around sort of standard of care standard practice uh which help mitigate the risk in your device the other thing i'd also want to sort of stress uh is again the point i made during the talk about not needing to be a hundred percent you know you, you, you could imagine a system, you know, if you improve the survival rate of a, a risky technique from 20% survival rate to 30% survival rate, that, that's an improvement. That's a good thing. The fact that there's some big scary risks in that 70%, that, that, yeah, yes, they're still there, but you're improving on the standard of care. And so, um, yeah, that, that's something else to bear in mind when you're, you're think about the overall risk in your system. Oh, thank you. Um, so the next one, I'm not sure with. I'll 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 I'll, I'll let you sort of answer it, but then I probably could add some stuff to this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but how exactly is the clinical evaluation of software um, as an ad, uh, a software enabled medical device done? How is that? How is the clinical evaluation done? Uh, well, so so. Uh, Clinical evaluation is a is a, is another big topic all by itself, unfortunately. Um, but I 
as a starting point, I'd suggest you don't see software as as a separate part of the system. Think think of the device holistically. So so if you're thinking about the the clinical evaluation, you need to be thinking about the whole system. Um, so in, in much the same way as if you had a piece of hardware, um, you, 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 you need to understand the, the configuration that you're putting into the clinical trial and that sort of thing. You need to control and understand any updates that might be made during the course of that clinical trial. Um, but yeah, it, it, broadly speaking, it, it doesn't need to be treated differently to anything else. The the where it starts to get really tricky and is definitely the subject of an entirely different talk um, is when you're talking about uh, sort of machine learning, development of a machine learning system and the, the training data sets. Um, the, the, there's not a lot of, of definitive guidance out yet at the moment in that area, um, but the thing to focus on, I think, is is really understanding if we talk about something like machine learning, understanding the, the and controlling the data sets which you use to originally train the system. The, the, you then conduct your your clinical trial and, and how you're going to evidence at the end of that clinical trial. Perhaps the system has you know, has grown, has learned how what, what data you're going to use at the end of that to be able to demonstrate that performance is at, at least on a par with where you were when you started hopefully you know improved how, how do you provide evidence to that Lot, lots of people are scratching their heads in that area because it is it is quite a tricky one to to get a handle on yeah um certainly and um we see a lot of um sort of requests for clinical evaluations for for these types of technologies um, and I mean, I guess the best place to go really would be your clinical trials methodology units, because then they try and understand exactly what your software is trying to do um, and whether it actually is going to contribute to any patient, um, you know, clinical outcomes. You know, if it's just purely looking at improving a service, then that's that's slightly different. Um, you probably wouldn't go through them and you'd go talk directly to procurement. But if it's got an intended action on the patient, um, so going back to David's definition of a medical device compared to health healthcare device is, um, you know, it's what is it? Is it going to diagnose something? Is it going to help in the treatment? Is it going to inform a treatment decision? Those are the things that clinical trialists would be looking at is how do we evaluate those? And they wouldn't look at the software on its own, as you're saying, David, they actually looking at the entire healthcare system and how that's going to contribute to that. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, so thinking to commercialize software um, on the cloud, e.g. the Amazon AWS, is something in line with, so thinking, let me re try and rephrase that, thinking to commercialize software on the clouds is something in line with medical device regulations. I'm not quite sure I get the sense of, of that. Um, uh, no, I mean, the, 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 if you're if you're deploying something cloud based, um, there are there are multiple challenges. Obviously, it's it's the way many things are going at the moment. Um, the the key themes, I suppose, are the ones that I was I was sort of trying to touch on in the talk. Um, you, you've obviously got you need to think about things like the fundamental connect connectivity. You know, when this things is thing is buried in the bowels of a hospital, is it, can it get connectivity to the cloud? Does it need live connectivity, or can it, you know, connect every evening or or every t every time it sees the outside world? Um, the implications of that we 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 talked briefly about. What about what if a device remains unconnected for large periods of time and that sort of thing? Um, uh, and then it's obviously the the kind of basic cybersecurity aspects of that um, straying into sort of GDPR territory and that sort of thing. Although in many respects, something like AWS is is quite a useful platform because you could certainly argue AWS is state of the art in, in that terms, in those terms really, and, and in terms of security and that sort of thing. Um, Again, a bit like my analogy of whether you do you do you or don't you use uh, the Windows operating system. 
there's there's a lot of work gone into AWS. You need to think really carefully whether you could even get close to the level of performance, sophistication and security by trying to homebrew something. I'd suggest that is definitely a non-starter. Um, so um, yeah, so so it's so it's all possible, but it but the the, the challenge I suppose is that this whole area particularly cloud-based stuff is still quite fluid and so what you might find at the end of your development uh, are the applicable rules or the guidance might be different to what we've what we've got at the moment um, and again the the emphasis I suppose is try not if, if you document everything if you think through everything in a balanced and proportionate way uh, if you follow a good development process then at the very least you you minimize your risk of having to go back and change anything if something something crawls out the woodwork later uh, that that tells you you've got to follow a slightly different direction okay um and they've provided a bit of clarification so they've said or oh, basically you do not have control of the hardware so what happens if the hardware fails uh, well, on on AWS, uh, I'm not sure what their latest uptime is, but it's astonishingly high. It's almost almost perfect. Um, so uh, it, it's going to depend on the nature of the risks of the system. So so that that's what you need to be thinking about. Um, uh, so it falls back on things like my my ventilator analogy. I mean, is is if 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 AWS is keeping your ventilator alive, has AWS and the connection to AWS got good enough, sufficiently guaranteed uptime um, that that you're happy with it? Um, the, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, I mean, even taking something something as significant as a ventilator, some of the highest risk devices. Uh, you can put alarm systems in these things. So, so if your ventilator loses connectivity to a, a AWS, all the alarms go off, all hell breaks loose, and and you know everybody runs into the room and does whatever is necessary. That that can be a, a, an acceptable risk mitigation. That's partly what alarms are there for. We didn't really talk about alarms today, um, but yeah, I mean it, it's it's about taking that balanced view as to what. You need to think about that impact um, and, and then take a balanced view on whether that that the potential harm resulting from that risk is, is going to be acceptable. OK, great. Um, next question. What does what does regulatory strategy work involve? What does regulatory strategy work involve? Uh, I well, I think that sounds like a question about about the broader approach to your your device development um so you you do want to think about the your your regulatory strategy quite early on in the the product development process that the, the software standards are just one of of many that could apply to your device, um, particularly anything with software integrated into it tends to have some electronics associated with it. And there's um, a whole uh, electrical safety standard um, associated that, that you have to meet. That one's pretty weighty. That's something like 600 pages long. So it's it's quite a big one. Um, yeah, so so again, it's 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 in the same way as getting the software architecture right early on. I would encourage anybody who is early in their product development journey to find some get some early stage regulatory advice. That you know, that that might be an an hour or two's chat with a regulatory consultant, or or maybe it, it extends into just a a day or two of mapping out. Um, the processes that you need to follow and that sort of thing. There are there are two dual pathways that that you will eventually need to think of. One one is that as the what's called the legal manufacturer, you are going to have to have quality systems in place to govern everything that you do and the supply of your devices. And then there are the the, the regulatory pathway for the actual device itself and how you actually design and develop a device that is is safe and can be C marked, UKCA marked. 
Thank you. Next question. What type of AI and cybersecurity documentation is required as part of CE UK CA mark application? Oh, if only we knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that 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 just right now that is kind of the the million dollar question. Um, uh, and and you know AI covers such a, a broad definition of things. It's it's really tricky. They they I guess they at the moment it's kind of baby steps. I mean the the best the, the only guidance we've really got at the moment is is. 62304 and following the processes in 62304. Um, so it's about how you've you know documenting your development and how it's designed and that, and then I think you extend that into your your expectations for the system and how you are going to control control the risks of undesirable changes. How are you going to know if your system has gone off and trained in completely the wrong direction? Um, how, how do you, does it, does it self update or do you have a rolling program of updates where maybe, maybe you gather data every six months and then there's an update to the system or all, all of these sort of things. Um, need to be thought about there's a good anecdotal story i don't i don't know if it's an apocryphal story or not to be honest um but somebody uh got got their imaging system to look at look through um x-rays um it, the, to look for broken bones and they they'd got an entire training data set uh they'd um uh, run the system. It all got learned. It was fine. They, I think they, they trialed it in one hospital, rolled it out to another hospital, and it completely fell over. Um, and the reason was that all of the, nobody had spotted in the training data that that all of the X-ray images had already been pre-assessed, whether it was a broken bone on or not, and they'd all got a little tiny mark in the corner of the image, like a tick, if you like, in the corner of the image, if there was a broken bone in the image. And so the machine learning had started out looking for broken bones and eventually taught itself to look for the tick in the bottom corner of the of the data. Um, so as soon as they went to a hospital who had a slightly different way of imaging, slightly, you know, maybe they put the tick in the top, top left hand corner rather than the bottom left hand corner, uh, the system fell apart. So it's that, that, as I say, I don't know if that that might be a slightly apocryphal story. I'm not quite sure, but um, I don't think so. I think you're on the right track. It definitely but, did happen. Um, but it, so. it, it, yeah, it, it's it's yeah. well, when the as the system learns, how can you demonstrate it still works? That that is your that that that's your challenge, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there's no yeah. and I think one way to do that, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think that example just illustrates some of the challenges that we also face with artificial intelligence. Is, is it really artificial intelligence? Is if it's if it's looking for a tick or some other visual cue to determine whether something's the right thing or not, then what is it actually doing? Um, and sometimes that's where some of the skepticism tends to come in from from the clinician's perspective. Is um, they're really interested to find out what you're training the system to recognize and is it actually recognizing that thing or something else yeah. um, the, on the data that you're providing. Yeah, the, the, there's a whole we, there's a whole commercial aspect to this as well, which is worth bearing in mind, um, which is it's not just about how do you convince the regulators that your system is safe and effective. You might manage to convince them. Um, how do you convince the clinicians? How do you convince your peers that that what you've designed works and does what it says on the tin? Because because yeah, yeah that, that's really a sort of a commercials marketing kind of, you know, it's it, it, it's a really yeah, it's it, it's tricky because if you deploy something and nobody believes its answers, that everybody's double double checking it, is it offering any benefit? And then which point is anyone going to buy it? <laughs> so so yeah. these the system yeah. systems have to have to have come with an element of trust um, in order to have a, a to offer a, a commercially viable solution as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. OK, so what looks like the final question, unless any others come in um, as decision support 
as a decision support tool, how can we quantify the most severe risk to the patient? We do not connect directly to the patients, but rather uh, um, offer clinicians a tool to support their decisions. Yeah, so um, the well, I'd have to understand a little bit more about about you know the, the, to what level decision support is being made. But they they have tightened up in this area quite a lot. Uh, it used to be ten years or so ago, you could you you would put your put your device through saying it was a decision support tool, and that meant wash wash my hands. That you know it's all the responsibility of the clinician. Don't worry about it, Mr. Regulator. Please please pass my device. Um, th they've kind of got wise to that, which is really uh, when I was talking about medical device classification, why you, it's quite hard to find class one medical device software these days because most things at least imply something and and most, you know, most regulators will then take the view, well, even if even if it's decision support, it's they're still relying on that supporting evidence to be right, to be good. It's going to lead them in a particular direction um so yeah that, so then it, it's well it, it it all ultimately comes back to the risk um so so it's if it's decision support how how supporting you know what when the when the clini clinician sees the the information that you provide what what are the actions that they're going to take and and if that answer is wrong you know incorrect in, in one way or the other what does what does that action or that resulting inaction um cause and and as i said earlier i mean are there are there other aspects you know do you if you have a blood test you know if, if it's repeated in two weeks and it gets picked up then is that going to be okay um yeah lot, lots and lots of different different scenarios but as, I, as i've said several times now I, I think i think you try and write it down but but then also think don't forget that context of of what can the software you know realistically help with if the software says you know we've can't think of an example off the top of my head, but if this, if if the software is giving you a a, a support to your diagnosis, it can't then actually influence the decision that what what the clinician does with that information. If you so to me, so you can't you the software can't mitigate the clinician making the wrong the clinician making the wrong decision if if you've presented the right uh, evidence. So. Yes, tricky. It is well. Whoever had that question could always get in touch, and we can delve into it in more detail because it'll 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 depend on the specifics of exactly what they're what they're trying to do. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. I mean, I mean, thinking through an example of one that we had was um, a software tool that was designed to um, aid surgeons in making a go no go decision for surgery. So they basically mm -hmm. picked through a whole a lot of parameters for the patient and then the system would tell them or well, actually this patient either needs to lose weight or they need to go on this regime or they need to go for surgery um, which on the surface looks brilliant but actually from the surgeon's point of view they didn't see what value it added to the process because they mm. already go through that in their heads um, because they've done so many cases they've probably known this patient um, if it's a long-standing patient, they know exactly what they need to do. They know what therapies they need to do. So what value is this adding? Um, and they actually mentioned that if the software could then tell them the outcome, which was the most positive, which was likely to generate the most positive outcome for the patient, as you know, actually, instead of this surgery, you do this kind of surgery. That's something that they would be looking at rather mm -hmm. than telling them something that they can already figure out or they already know, because you can then put the software in the hospital but after a while people will stop using it and they'll just default to whatever they were using before because it's easier and quicker 
Yeah, yeah, and and of, and the other aspect to it, I suppose, is the the level of of skill of the person using uh, of of medical skill, of the person using the system. Yeah, you know, doc doctors are are hopefully going to have a, a a wealth of other experience and skill and training and things that they will bring to bear. So, you know, in a in a the example of a surgical case or something, you, you can reasonably expect a surgeon to exercise some of their own judgment as to whether they should cut somewhere or or not. Um, but they might be heavily supported by the tool, but they're also a, a you know, they're also a surgeon. They, they ought to do that. Whereas, um, you know, something that I might go and buy from Boots that tells me, you know, something about my health and then causes me to take a bunch of medicine or something like that. You know, whether it says if it says on the box, if this tells you you feel sick and you've got these other symptoms, then then do something. You, you know, you you have to uh, question whether somebody's going to, you know, how heavily somebody's going to lean on that that result or or otherwise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so let's see, something else has come in. Can you comment on the necessary conditions for the following scenario? In a robot assisted surgery where a device is making a decision for the surgeon on what to do, including algorithms and also augmented visualization, what are the considerations we should give? Uh, what was the last bit of that? Sorry, didn't catch so, it. And I'll just we read the, the scenario. So in a robot assisted surgery where a device is making a decision for the surgeon on what to do, which will include algorithms and also augmented visualization. OK, yeah. what considerations should we give? Uh, I want to give a flippant answer and say a lot. Um, the. I mean, that that on the face of it obviously sounds like quite a high category of device um you you'd be surprised though actually i mean it, it, this is where applying the rules uh has a significant impact it, if your if the surgery happens to be if if it's on the central nervous or central circulatory system then you are going to be class three the highest that you could possibly be um if if you're on other parts of general anatomy, should we call them, um, then um, you, you're most likely going to be a, a class 2B device on, on the face of the very brief description that we've got there. Um, yeah, I mean, that the description of what you've got there has got several fairly complex elements to it because you've got sort of augmented visualization which you've got to show works and is effective you've got um, the robotic element uh, to it which you've got to show does whatever it's supposed to do performs as it's supposed to perform um, and then you've got the you know any big decision making AI uh, stuff going on in terms of how it goes from what it's seen to to how it performs the the analogy i suppose with the descriptions i gave earlier though of course is one of the things you might be able to separate out in that context is the performance of the robot if you remember my um slide about uh, laboratory equipment and proving that the hardware works what you might be able to do is sort of slightly separate you know does does the robot arm articulate in all the right ways can it cut or move or whatever it does in all of the right ways effectively on its own and separate that from the question of how does it how does it know what it's seeing how does it know what it's going to do next so so you could treat those as, as two subtly sort of sort of different things uh, unfortunately i think that the decision making on what to do next is 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 likely to be the most difficult part of that um but yeah, I mean, again, again, if if anybody's got specific questions, then then get get in touch. That that on the face of it sounds like quite a quite a tricky problem. Okay, thank you. So I think that's 
all that has come through that we have. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I think Yuan was asked the question, said I realized my question was perhaps too specific. Um, yeah, you can definitely get in touch with, um, with David um, and then obviously have a more thorough conversation around that. So I guess one final question from me is um, if people want to carry on some of these conversations with yourselves and EG technology, what's the best route for them? You know, what would, how would you advise they go about that? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, my, my details are on the, on the slide there. I'm, I'm assuming we'll be sending the slides out after the talk. So, and, and certainly anybody that wants them is, is, is welcome to have them. So um, yeah, just, just drop, drop, Drop me an email. Drop me a, a LinkedIn. Yeah, hope, I'm sure you'll be able to find me on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, well, we'll we'll see what we can do. See if we can, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction at the very least. Okay. We we but remembering that we we are uh, product product design engineers. So um, it, as we that means we have a, a lot to do in terms of developing things in accordance with the regulations and things like that. But some of the very much more specialist um, regulatory advice you we might just be able to point you in the direction of somebody who's who can help a bit more okay no that's that's very useful and um lois has also posted um, um a blog that you've you've done david um i will also so i'll circulate this as well um out um with um with the recording so the recording will be available um, and I'll circulate that out together with the link um, that Lois has just put down. Um, and um, I mean, from our side as a, as a surgical make, as I mentioned earlier on, I mean, you know, we have invited David um, specifically to talk about this because that's not expertise that we have. Um, but one of the reasons as well is, you know, if you're considering submitting a, a fund, funding application, particularly to the NHR, for example, I4I, and you do need sort of um, clinical expertise or you're looking to have a medtech focus group with a bunch of patients or carers to find out what they think about it and whether they would vouch for it um, if you've got a technology that's going to go through NICE, for example. Um, they do have patient panels, then that's something you can also contact us about. Um, and, you know, where, where we can, we're able to help. And where we are not able to help, then you can obviously forward and signpost um, to um, organizations like EG Technology um, and others that work with, in different um, sort of clinical areas or might have different um, expertise levels in different things. So we tend to be sort of a signposting service for that. Um, but um, thank, thank you once again um, for everyone that, that came through. Um, thank you, David, um, for giving up your time and talking us through what is um, a complex topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Oh, Hope oh, it's been thanks. useful. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, I'll I'll definitely send out um, the 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 video, um, a link to the video for for everybody else to sort of play at their leisure, and they can go through your slides as well. Um, and um, the contacts are on on the slides for either the surgical meta cooperative. Um, if you're looking for a different clinical area, then let me know, and I can signpost you to the relevant areas as well. Um, so thank you once again, um, David, and thank you to everybody else. Great, thanks very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.